welcome back to Book Buzz with Janet Pang, a podcast where we talk about romance books, our current reads, and we also have the pleasure of sitting down with some of our favorite authors and chatting with them about their amazing books. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. We are back with an author interview. We haven't done one. Um, we did Molly's a couple months ago, and I'm so excited to be back and talking and us talking to the amazing and funny and super talented Trilina. I I started reading Trilina, I believe it was like a year and a half ago um, when I re- I saw her book. Um, I believe it was Filthy Little Pretties, which is her. It's I believe it's like I would categorize it as like a bully romance i think they're like in prep school and i read the first one then the second one i think was just releasing so i went ahead and got the second one and after that i was just like i love her heroes like they're so mean and so like (laughs) i love mean heroes so i was like super excited whenever she announced um she was doing a duet um Mm -hmm. It was like a forbidden romance and their families were like enemies. So it's sort of like a retelling of Romeo and Juliet. Um, mm-hmm. Love Romeo and Juliet. Don't don't like the ending, but this duet, Chef Kisses. So it's literally amazing that we have her finally in the podcast because we met her. I met her for the first time in Vegas. Mm-hmm. Vegas was amazing like we got to talk to her she's super hilarious she's Mm -hmm. i just i freaking love her and like being around her like it lines up everybody's mood yeah and she's like so freaking crazy i just love her and she just recently released um tangled and tinsel which is i think everybody who has heard our podcast has seen our like instagram (laughs) post knows we don't read our age so whenever she announced this was in our age, I was like, ooh, this is going to be the first book I don't read. But, you know, I, t- I, I took the bullet, man, and I read it. <laughs> and it was not what I expected. Like, I was, I'm not going to lie, I was a little bit like, like, what am I reading? Like, I felt like, I was like, trying to look over my shoulder just to make sure nobody was there, even though I knew nobody was there, but it was that spicy that I was like, Oh my freaking God. Like, cause I'm like, I don't read art age. So it was like yeah. shock to me, but it was mm-hmm. really, like, it was spicy. It was good. It's like, it's more of like the holiday treats for everybody who wants like a steamy holiday read. Um, mm-hmm. I totally recommend this one. I won't straight out, and I'm going to tell Trilina this. I probably won't ever read an RH unless she's the one writing it. <laughs> because I cannot bring myself to read anything, but if she's mm-hmm. writing it, I'll read it just because I just. So it's such an honor, and I'm super excited for us to have her on here with us talking. We're going to be talking about her um, Tangled and Tinsel books, we're going to be talking about her other books, and there's some questions that I want to ask her mm-hmm. about the whole RH world because she's the first author that we all have on here that writes that has written RH. So yeah. I have some questions. So mm-hmm. make sure that you stick around and listen to that podcast if you haven't listened to Tinsel. If you haven't read Tangled and Tinsel, I don't think we're going to have spoilers, so you can keep listening. But if you want to be saved let's skip this until you read it and we hope you guys enjoy this interview thank you so 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 much for joining us today it's seriously i freaking love you like i ever since i came across your books it's like i was like i've always said you're so funny you're so crazy and then i met you in vegas and i was like oh my gosh (laughs) that person who's the life of the party and (laughs) I just freaking adore you. And so thank you so freaking much for joining us today because, and I'm just going to go flat out and say it. You're the first author that I read an RH book for. Do you know what? You're not the first person to say that to me. So many people have said that. And that's like the biggest compliment ever that people love me enough to even support. Like a couple people reached out and they were like, I don't do like why I choose. I don't do those books. And I was like, oh, you don't have to read it. Like, and they were like, no, I'm going to read it because I love you. And I was like, 
Yeah. Well, then if you hate it, don't review it. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's sweet because they're like, but I actually don't think, I mean, I know this is technically that, but I think it's a different kind of that. It is, because I was saying it earlier. I was like, you know, I don't do our age, but I was like, it's Trilina. I cannot not read it. Like, her heroes are so freaking yummy. And I'll, <laughs> plus, after certain scenes that I read in your previous books, I'm like, I am curious. Like, I want to read to see what she comes up with. So, um, I do want to say, I think going forward, you are the only author that I'm ever going to read if you do write our age again. Well, I'll definitely do it like this again, because so this feels more like group sex to me and not necessarily like what tropey, like, and I don't mean that in a bad way. Like, I love people who write tropes, but because I always venture away from writing like a trope book, um, this felt like something that was a kink, like a shared kink between people. And it was just kind of like group sex. And they were like, this is fun. And then they were like, but we kind of like you and we kind of like this and we don't even know what we're doing. We just kind of want to see where it goes from here. And that's, that's it. Like we didn't have to go through, I think most RHs are either dark or they're like new adult dark where like she's falling or they're trying to convince her to like be in this lifestyle or whatever. Like it's always kind of that. And where she's like falling in love with each person. And then she's like, I can't choose. I have to have all of you, which is like, you know, entitled, but like, she, <laughs> but like, that's like, that's always like the, the kind of background for it. And that's not how I approached it. I was like, I just want her to be like, wouldn't it be nice to get fucked by four dudes? And they were like, wouldn't it be nice to fuck that girl? Like, and they were just on the same page. And then all of a sudden they were like, but we like you, hmm. you know? And that was, and like, then I went from there. so I feel like that's why it's not people that read it, read it and they're like, why do I find this hot? I don't like this. It's because you have to give up the illusion that you don't have to give up that part of you in a romance novel where you love her falling in love and only for that to be recreated with three other people. And you're like, no, but I just want her to be with this person. Or there's always like a favorite or something like that. You didn't have to do any of that. I just gave you the salty part of people enjoying this like really kinky moment and then going, you want to date? And then we get to fast forward and they're in love, but we already like them having group sex. So we don't care about that. You know what I mean? And I will say, cause I said it in the beginning, I, when I first started the book, like I knew it was going to be steamy. But as I'm reading, you know, diving into it, I'm like looking over my shoulder, <laughs> even though I know nobody's down <laughs> back there. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I leaned in. That's what I learned about this genre is I was like, if I'm going to do it, I'm not going to hold back. Like people want to go for it for in the shop. Like they, you know, what I mean, like if I was writing small town, I'm not sure I would do the same thing. You know what I mean? Like it's different. And I was like, but. The women that read this, they want, they're like, bring it. Let's, and I'm like, well, I can, I could do that. So I leaned in real hard and I was yeah. like, let's do it. Let's make them as saucy yeah. and as sexy as possible. I feel that even if you don't like our age, I think it's something fun because it falls in, in its own category to where it's just something for sure. fun, steamy for the holidays that I feel like right. after COVID, we all need that little, you know, fun read. Yeah. <laughs> I felt like the world feels heavy all the time. Like every day you wake up and you turn on the news or you read the paper and it's something else that makes you feel like you're carrying like this huge weight on your shoulders. There is a lot of change happening in the world that's good, but also change can feel heavy, you know? And I feel like for a lot of people walking through the, whether it's, you know, whatever change you're dealing with, whatever you're watching on TV, all of that feels really heavy, right? I, 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 anything sad because I already did that and I didn't enjoy that experience even though I love that book more than life itself I did not enjoy that experience it made me really like down after and it took me a long like I didn't write anything for a year and a half yeah and I want to enjoy if I'm going to choose this as a career I'm going to thing that I like doing you know like that yeah. doesn't make me feel like I need to go and get like a vat of antidepressants after I write it like I don't want to do that <laughs> so so I was like I want to enjoy this so I wanted to write something that just that we could all just kind of come together and have this like you know, I'm like, let's just laugh. Let's just laugh and let's be like, oh, shit. Like, everybody yes. can have like a, a good moment where we're like, holy, he did not do that. Like, and I wanted it to be like a shared experience. So I felt like we needed a little levity for the holidays. So that's why I wrote it for myself because I needed levity when I was writing. And I thought, I hope people enjoy this because, you know, I wanted to be, it, we deserve it. We deserve yeah. it. And it highlights the things that we love in books. It mm -hmm. also has a little bit of comedy. And, you know, a lot of people are like, you know, there is no plot. There is a plot. But what they mean by that is that we don't travel through like to love. Yeah. Like you're not getting that whole nuance. And that's okay. The plot is Samantha. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> the plot yeah. is her. So, and it has it, you know, like we go through it, but you're not having, you don't have to, I equated it yesterday to like an Adam Sandler movie. You don't have to sit and think long and hard about like, what did they mean by that? What was happening? You just get to take it right as it is and just enjoy it in the moment. Yeah, so I'm glad people are enjoying it in the moment. I was, I was like, oh my God. Like I never thought in my whole entire, like since I started reading that I was going to be reading this book and I'm like, oh, like. I, well, I don't know of a lot of like contemporary why choose books or like books that are just like, like it's just regular people like it's not a dark book it's not like it's like there's no secret society like it's literally just these four dudes that like to do this thing with this chick like it's not i don't i haven't read a lot of books like that so i felt like why not that sounds fun <laughs> it was true trust me it was fun reading it i cannot imagine when you went through writing it <laughs> so i'm like i went through a lot of my kids barbies is what i did trying to figure out the hell everybody went because i was like wait a minute like i even made my husband get up once and I was like sit down and I stuck my foot up on like the the couch my like crotch was right by his face and I was like holding onto the couch and he's like what are you doing I was like not turn your head like this like what I have to hold on to something to get it was like what are you doing and I was like listen I need to know how this goes I don't know where everybody goes like there's a lot of shit slinging at her right now I need to know where to go where to put it <laughs> oh my goodness and that's actually one of our questions like what <laughs> How did you get in, like, how do you guys write those type of scenes? Like, when, because this is the first book you've written where it's, you know. Multiple people, yeah. So how did you go from writing scenes when it's just two to writing scenes where it's multiple? Was um, that hard? Or no, is it I'm easy? a very, like, so I'm a very sex positive person. Like, I think that um, maybe it's because I grew up in the 90s. So, like, I don't have any, like, I, I can't, okay. I am so shy personally. Like I can't, like I sit down to watch like Magic Mike or something like that and I blush. Like fifty <laughs> shades. I watched it like this in the movie theater. Like I was so embarrassed. But um, but I that doesn't mean that like I don't have any real like I said, maybe it's because I grew up in the nineties. I don't like if something's sexy, it's sexy, right? Mm -hmm. So when I sit down to write it, if I think it's hot when I'm writing it, I know other people are gonna think it's hot when I'm writing it. So it's never sex scenes aren't a problem for me. Like when I sit down and write them, I just think about like I think women in general, at least I know I do, but also a lot of readers, men that are kind of, that know, dominate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, and most men in real life just become domineering and that's rude. Like they don't know how to be dominating. Do you know what I mean? Like it just crosses the line. They're like, they're just not good at that. They should read more romance novels. But, um, but the, like he, for these guys, I tried to pick four different, characteristics of men that I found super attractive. Mm -hmm. So when I was writing the scene and she had moments with him in my head, I was just switching who I was, who I was, who I was, who Samantha was, um, <laughs> ready and slip. Um, who, who, but I was like switching who I was like, who she was, or I was having sex with in my head. Do you know what I mean? So it was like when she was talking to readers, she was doing stuff with Reed, then it was how he was charming and he talked dirty. And I made the things that he did hot, if I was just having sex with that dude and then I made it so that if Cole was doing this, this is what I thought would be sexy with that dude. I just switched it like that in my head. It wasn't hard. I thought of them as necessarily a group, even though they work well as a group. Um, that part, I had to go back and make sure that it was really cohesive and fluid. I had to read through a lot of it to make sure that it was like flowing and no one was just kind of left out for too long or like just entertaining themselves for too long. Like that was like, how long could he do that for? So I had to like make sure that it was all cohesive. But other than that, when it was just the person, it was always her and the person, her and the person, her and the person. It just happened to be in like short sentences. She was just switching <laughs> her attention a lot. How did you come up with that idea, though? Like, what made you say, I'm going to write this book. It's going to be about this. Because like you said, you came back from because you took a little break after you wrote that duet. Um yeah. And then it was like, what, a year, year and a half, I think you said? It's a like year and a half since I published the book, yeah. yeah. So what made you come back and say, because that duet was, in my opinion, it was very Emotion. heavy. Yes. It was. Mm -hmm. And for you to take that break and then come back and say, I'm going to write this story and it's going to like be something completely different than what I released last. How did you decide that? Well, I was not writing anything and I had started like a bunch of projects. So I have like probably 
projects that have like, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 words, like 10, 12, 20 chapters that I would start and then just stop because I just couldn't make the leap to like finish them. Nothing was really catching me and staying with me. And so I would just put them aside and I thought it was more important to just kind of stay writing, you know, because, but nothing was really happening. And I started to get nervous. So I was going to just kind of become like irrelevant in this world. Like, cause if you don't publish in the indie world, then people forget you. I started to become really nervous kept telling me all the time her name's abby Jimenez. she's a traditionally published author she actually has a book coming out called yours truly go pick it up um, <laughs> she's, she's actually pretty amazing and um she's like my sister from another mister like i love her so much and we were talking one day and she's like how come you don't write a rom-com and i was like because i'm funny in person ha, 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 ha. like i'm not i'm not sure if that would translate to paper you know and she was like dummy if you can say and i was like be quiet stay in your own lane so we were laughing about that and i was and I sat down and I was trying to write one, come up with ideas, nothing was coming. And I made my husband last year buy me the Hallmark channel because A, I'm a fucking high maintenance girl. And B, <laughs> because I want to do Christmas movies all year round. Sometimes in the middle of July, I just want to sit there with like a glass of wine and some popcorn and pretend it's Christmas. And I'll turn the fucking air conditioner hella high and I'll put sweaters on and lay on the couch. And he's like, we, we live in California. This is like a thousand dollar bill right now. And I'm like, I'm watching <laughs> Hallmark. You know, like I get excited. So he, so I made him buy me Hallmark and I was watching a movie and it was one of those like terrible, you know what I mean? Like soap opera, like, you know, you were like, were you on the guiding light back in the day? Like it's an old act, mm -hmm. just terrible movies where it's like bad acting and they're like, they were having dinner. This is how bad they were having dinner and you could see through the window and it was light out, but they had candles lit and they were pretending <laughs> at night, like low budget. You know what I mean? I was like, I'll follow you. Fuck it. I'll do it. Like, let's do it. So I was like, it's so bad. And so, because they were like, oh, dinner's going late. And I was like, it's noon, guys. We can see <laughs> but, but like, so they hear <laughs> the hero's best friend was like kind of being cheeky with the heroine. And his friend was like getting, it was like the moment really that like, gets jealous and realizes he likes her, right? <laughs> or she realizes, whatever. And so I was watching it and I started laughing to myself. And um, my husband was like, what are you laughing at? And I was like, you know, you watch too many romance novels when as soon as his friend started flirting with her, I was like, you should do them both. Like, <laughs> And he was like, you're <laughs> ridiculous. And we started laughing and it stayed in my head. And that's how every book comes to me. Something stupid happens. And then it just stays in my head. And I came to bed that night and he was like, far off. And I was like, I am far off. Leave me alone. And he, that's his like code word for like, you're imagining stuff. And I was like, okay, leave me alone. And he's like, okay. Puts like some, he likes to watch at night. And I just laid there. And then I started writing on my phone and the first part of the story came that night. And then I was like, that's what I'm going to do. And he goes, what are you going to do? And I was like, I'm going to write a rom-com. And he was like, oh, great. What's it about? And I was like, I'm going to write about four guys railing a girl. <laughs> and he was like, wait, what? <laughs> and I was like, go full bang bang. It's going to be great. <laughs> he was like, the fuck? And I was like, it's going to be amazing. I'm so excited. <laughs> but he's like, I'm never going to let her watch that channel. Again. He was like, wow. <laughs> he even said to me, he goes, you're trying to sexualize Christmas. I was like, bitch, I'm the reason for the season. Get out. Like, this is what's happening. Like, I was so... <laughs> But he's like, I support you. I was like, thank you. So that's how they came about from a shitty Hallmark movie. And I'm so happy that I watched it. <laughs> so keep watching Hallmark movies, Trilina. Yeah, I'm like more Christmas books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so a little bit backtracking, um, because I know we spoke like how you came up with Tangled and Tinsel, but yeah. talk to us a little bit how you started writing in general. Like what made you decide that you're going to say, I'm going to write romance this is what I'm going to do. Um, this is how my characters are going to be. Because I feel like, personally, your heroes are, like, very, like, I love them. I f Like, I love a bad boy. But I feel like your characters are very unique in the sense to where you keep thinking about them even days, weeks after you finish the book. Like, mm -hmm. I remember I was messaging you, like, freaking crazy when I finished the book. <laughs> The first book, and I was like, um, hello, I can't stop thinking about him. I only read the first book like so many freaking times until you released the second. So it's like, right. what made you want to write and also like narrow down what type of books you wanted to write? Okay. So um, I used to be a professional dancer. I don't know if you know that. So I used to dance professionally and like I toured around all that kind of stuff. And then I got injured. And I couldn't dance anymore. And so that led to kind of like an existential crisis because the only thing I knew how to do, the only thing I could put on a resume was like, I could do eight fucking pirouettes. Like that gets you no job, by the way. So like, I was like, what am I going to do? I started working in a casino before I met my husband. And then when I had a real career, 
and I don't want a career that I just do. Like, I don't want a job that I just do. And I know that sounds bougie and entitled, like, because that's what I'm doing right now. But like, I wanted to do like, not right now, but back then. Mm -hmm. But I want a job that like, I feel just as um, kind of like pulled into and it makes me feel just alive. Like, dance used to because that's all I still consider myself a dancer it's weird like in my head I'm forever gonna be a dancer. I don't know how to differentiate myself from dance so um when I started thinking about different things I, he gave me this like idea once he was like you should make like a top 10 list of everything you like to do and then like find careers within that so um I was doing that and as I was doing that writing was not one of them and I was journaling mm -hmm. so I, to try to like you know like talk about my feelings it was when journaling became big and I was buying all these like pretty little journals and writing all my feelings you know whatever <laughs> and uh when while I was doing that and trying to find the career that I wanted um I didn't like one of the like I made a journal entry that I hated and it sounded like just it was so well it was kind of depressing like I read it back and I was like ah oh, like sad bitch era what's happening like come on like and I was feeling bad for whatever reason I just decided I don't like that I'm gonna change it and so I just kept going from that journal entry and I just the ending of it like I made it kind of like a fictional story like what I wish that I would have said and then I that stayed with me for a minute and then I thought I wonder what would happen if I did this I wonder what would have happened if I felt like this and then it just kind of started to spiral and I was like I was just kind of open to these ideas and like trying something new for myself so I sat down and I started to write and I want to say something like a month later, not even three weeks later, my whole first book was written. Oh, wow. And that's the prologue of that first book. It's now unpublished because it had 172 fucking exclamation points. Like nobody needs that excited when they talk. <laughs> so like I, I got to fix it before I publish it again. It's a great story though. And it actually had great reviews, but like people don't need to be that excited to speak. You know what I mean? Like, so I, uh, so anyway, so that became, book though and the prologue was actually my journal entry and I did not think it would do anything at all I didn't even know book talk or book on face like a book community existed on Facebook I didn't know any of this stuff and I just started kind of looking things up and trying to like find things and all of a sudden I found a whole community and I was like whoa and then I was like paying attention to what people were doing because I knew I was going to try to self-publish it didn't even know what I was doing and I just started dropping people's dms i didn't know like that was when people are like you shouldn't do that i had no clue and i would just drop in and like be funny and they would be like i'll read your book and all of a sudden it sold so it's like i kind of forced got my way into this and i it's not a story that's typical and it's not a story that i'm necessarily saying people should do if you're an indie author because i was led a lot by ignorance like i didn't know any better so i was just walking in like hey guys want to read my book like i had no clue and i just happened to get very lucky there was a lot believer that like when the universe like i believe in like the universe and stuff like that. i'm a believer that like when the universe wants you somewhere they will put you there and if you try to get away it will find ways back to get you there like you need to pay attention so i kept all my eyes like my eyes open and my like my fate my like like i kept myself open to opportunity and i sold a pretty decent amount of those books not a lot but like a pretty decent amount enough that i wrote my second book and then it just kind of went so i accidentally found my way into this career I it wasn't on purpose and then once I, I wrote a very unique way to start writing though like yeah it is a unique way to write your first book but I think I was supposed to like it was definitely like I was supposed to and because I had never been really influenced I had I hadn't really read any romance novels outside of like 50 shades Mm -hmm. I had no real knowledge of like the romance community. I didn't know the rules. I didn't know like you have to have an HEA or what this means. Like I was constantly Googling acronyms. I had no clue. Somebody invited me to like a release party on Facebook. And I was like, what do you do? I don't know what to do. What do I give away? <laughs> Is it a car? Am I giving away cars? Like, what am I doing? Like, I was so clueless. I was like, what's happening? Am I going to be like Oprah? Like, you like, what am I doing? <laughs> So I had like no idea what I was doing all the time and people were so kind to me and some people were really mean, but for the most part, I found my way through mm -hmm. and I have a thick skin. So it didn't really, you know, I was like, whatever. And I also have a real life off the internet that is helpful. Like I have real life people in my corner and I also have now people on the internet that I don't get to see in real life that I love so much. And I, that I consider like friends, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm really nice in those moments when people were being mean to you to have like someone to actually turn to and touch they could give you a hug and be like fuck them and you could just turn it off and go away you know that's important so i 
I accidentally stumbled into success. And that's the truth. Like, I wish that I had some kind of like, I, I mean, this release, this specific release and every release after once I had success, like once truth came out, the first mafia book, that's when I real six. And I was like, Oh my gosh. And then I just started devouring every piece of material that I could to help me with what I was supposed to do as an indie author. And I threw myself into it because that's how I am. I like to say, I want to be the best that I could be. So I, I ate up everything about writing. I ate up everything about storytelling and, you know, some parts I threw back and some parts I kept, I ate up everything about marketing. Like, and I just kept going, going, going. And this release in particular, I have worked my ass off for from morning till night. Like, and I, I believe in myself and, um, and this community is amazing. And I'm just not, I just refuse to stop until I like, I refuse to stop until I hit number one. <laughs> like I'm just fucking going, going, going. So that is how I came into writing. And then once I was here, developing the stories has always been the same answer. Whatever I feel creatively drawn to is what I write. So I've never fed me all the time. Like there are authors that follow the same pattern. Like they write a big series, like maybe they release monthly. Mm-hmm. I respect the hell out of that. I don't know how they do it, but like kudos, like bravo, bitch. It's amazing. Um, but I have never been able to do that. Stay in the same genre. That's how you get readers. S- write the same trope. That's how you get readers. Like I've been told a thousand things and I've never followed any of that. I write what I feel drawn to creatively. I create the people contextually correct to me. They're not always the same. I don't recreate the same character over and over. It's why I won't ever put out Roman's book from just like heaven or sitting like hell. It's why I will never put out Roman's book because Roman is attractive because he is a mirror to Calder. And that's why people like him. But if I write him, it's just another book about Calder. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not going to do that. Like that doesn't feel creatively awesome to me. I don't want to do that. I don't want to write the same character over and over again. That's my big long answer. (laughs) Well, I'm just going to go out here and say before pain goes to the next question. Like I am so happy the universe put you in this road because you are truly a light in our community in the book community you're so talented your books are amazing and you're hilarious like i see your stuff and i'm like the other day you posted something and i was like freaking (laughs) laughing i was like she's seriously so crazy (laughs) i am though like and you know that i'm like that in real life like it's not a like i like that in real life (laughs) Because I don't plan any of my stories on Instagram. Like, I do them right off the cuff, like, right away. <laughs> I just record them and press it, record and publish, record and publish. I never, like, plot them out. Like, a lot of people plot out their stories, like, because they're smart and better marketers, maybe. But I don't. I just talk on the fly. Like, I never plan it out. It's just like whatever I'm thinking. On the internet is what you get in person when you meet Trulina. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> I wish I could change. I'm not. I'm just don't that change. dumb. Like, it's, don't I'm change. that great. Don't ever <laughs> change. You're our literally... The funniest person ever. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. okay, this next question. What is one of the biggest challenges about writing and publishing? Um, so I don't think that there really is a challenge that I can speak to for myself because um, I'm super white presenting. So the world is kind of my oyster. Um, but I think that the real challenge of publishing even indie or trad is the fact that diversity is not included. I think that the real challenge in publishing is that money talks. And so um, it becomes kind of an elitist society. And if you have money to start your books, if you have money for ads, you can literally push people down to the bottom. Um, I think the real with publishing is that uh, is that diversity and romance or or women being sex positive as female characters is not normalized enough. I think that um, that the real problem and and challenge in publishing is that um, is that we uh, tend to um, not only refuse to un like we refuse to understand the nuance between um, like diversity needed and who should be writing diversity and who should like everybody refuses to take a step back and let people step forward. Like in the indie community, a lot of people compete in that they think that if I'm doing it, then you can't do it. 
Or if you're doing it too, it's a competition between us when really it's not. It's constantly like if I'm doing it and you're doing it and you're doing it and you're doing it, that just normalizes. It's very popular. So we tend to pit ourselves against each other instead of working together collaboratively because we're, we're actually stronger together than we are apart. Um, but we, we tend to end up pitting ourselves against each other because it's people are constantly scrambling for that number one mm -hmm. spot. Um, and greed, greed tends to win out a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, the best way for an author to fuel their greed is to make their audience came up with this idea when in reality, <laughs> If you're writing romance, you're already a fucking cliche. Like Shakespeare did it first and he wrote fan fiction. Like it's not even like, it's not, nobody's nobody's original. And you have to, if you're writing about love, you're already unoriginal. So, I mean, and I'm not talking about plagiarism. Those assholes are assholes. But like, I'm talking about just the idea of like, if you write the same trope as somebody else, people are like, you copied them. You didn't copy them. You read a fucking trope. And we should all be kind of more collaborative with that. Like be excited about the buildup with that. Actually with like covers and things, people are like, that's font the font like when the only thing trad got right is that when you make every cover look alike people buy them more mm -hmm. so um <laughs> i think that those are the real problems with publishing but i can't actually speak to any it would be unfair of me and it would also uh be super entitled and and really um out of touch for me i have so many challenges because i don't have any challenges mm -hmm. i'm super white presenting I write in a genre that people love. Um, I wrote a super smutty book. Like there was no, there were no challenges for me. I, I published a book and people wrote and people bought it. That was it. Like, I love it when people hate on 50 shades, but honestly, like that woman broke the doors open yeah. for romance novels. Like everyone that published rushed to publish a book right after she published. It was like, I'm going to write a romance book. You could have written trash, like dumpster <laughs> fire trash. And you would have been like, New York Times bestseller because everybody was just like, give me, give me, give me. Like they mm -hmm. couldn't get enough, right? Now, if it makes me laugh because if a lot of those people are still kind of on the top and a lot of those people, and deservedly so, like good for you for your work, right? But also those books sometimes don't last the time. Like what people expect now in 2022, if you were to re-release some of those books, yeah. they wouldn't do anything because people have, the expectations grow, right? Yeah. It's harder to publish now than it was in 2015. That being said, though, kudos to those girls, because with, without those women, none of us would be here. You know what I mean? Like they broke down doors. They were just busting glass ceilings. And that's like none of us would be here. So you have to give respect. You have to give props, whatever. But also there was a culture of like, I'm trying to get my book here. And there was a culture of competition. I mean, women have been pitted against each other for decades, for years, for thousands and thousands of years, since the beginning of time. Right. So naturally, sometimes when we come into an environment, we feel like, it's either me or it's you because the reality sometimes it's really just me or you because we're fighting against misogyny and patriarchy and all that kind of stuff. And there's only going to be room for one of us. So we have to treat each other like competition. So that, that culture has been nurtured for a long time. And because of that, the audience has come to the place where they believe this to be true so much, but it isn't true. Yeah. It just isn't. And people can use the same cover model. I mean, listen, Andrew Beernut has been on like yeah. 2, thousand <laughs> covers. If it's, <laughs> then none of those books would sell but they sell and everybody still thinks they love him in fact they sell more because they love the cover model people yeah. are like "Ooh, that that beer nut guy or they call him like bernie because they don't know his last name how to, how to like say his last name it's like when but, like, that there was a time period where chase chase matson or oh, everywhere yeah like it feels like for like the first half of he was the every, year like was 20, an 20 was chase matson. yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> and people got mad they were like but you're using that cover and you're using but it's actually beneficial to authors it really is like when everybody started doing like cartoon covers and like you know the cartoon people or whatever like the drawings of people yeah. everybody was like oh they're she's copying or she's she's copying your vibe and i was like don't say that let them because the reality is unless somebody actually copies your cover do you know what i mean like your actual the cover and you're like, thing, yeah it's exactly like mine but with a different title don't care don't care because people will really it, people do not get confused they don't go oh i meant to buy this book and i didn't buy that book that's not true they never that doesn't happen that just doesn't happen they know exactly what the fuck they're buying okay <laughs> and yeah. they, they will buy exactly the book they want to buy and you know and then on top of it it actually helps you like it we all kind of just keep lifting each other up mm -hmm. to the top yeah so i think that people should relax about that 
and like take a deep breath. And I also think that, you know, readers don't need to readers need to um, go off or get involved or um, defend an author because trust me when I tell you, I have not met one author, not one. I've met a lot. I have not met an author that cannot use their voice to another one when they need to. Mm -hmm. There are backdoor conversations that happen all day. There are private conversations that happen all day that say, I didn't like that. Don't do it all the time. We defend ourselves just fine. When an audience starts to do that and they're like, I didn't know how that happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it's always- I think that that has to stop. It has to be more collaborative between women. Yeah, and I feel like for the readers, in order for the book community to be fun, staying out of it is always the best answer just because, I mean, you don't want to escalate anything or add on to anything. Better just- Keep it fun. Keep it entertaining. Keep it, you know. Well, you know, if you have an opinion about something, that you're welcome to your opinion. Like, say you're, like, have your opinion. But then you're starting a conversation with people that may not have your opinion as well. So then be prepared for that, right? Like, you just can't go into something blindly and be like, listen, I call this person an asshole. I'm so surprised that people are coming back at me to, like, yell at me. Like, that, you started a conversation. Like, that's going to happen. You can give your opinion, but don't be an asshole <laughs> and be like disrespectful to somebody else's opinion that's my thing it's like you everybody has a voice i my opinion might not be your opinion and i think that's where it would be better if everybody said i agree with that and right. not took an offense to it well and i think that the internet is a funny place because the internet is one of those places like i've i've said this like i've had this conversation so many people that have asked me questions this week have about this actual topic and um, I've said the same thing on every other. So I hope that like your, your listeners like this too. When, when the internet came about and like there was social media, my kids wanted to get on social media and do these things. We had very candid conversations about it. And I told them that the internet for me is like the middle of a grocery store. That you are saying things that people that you don't know will hear. Mm-hmm. And so if you're not comfortable saying it with your whole chest in the middle of a grocery store where someone's mama might hear you and someone's uncle might hear you and the plumber behind you might hear you that you don't know, and you don't know where they come from, if you were not comfortable saying that in front of them, then turn it off. Because every conversation on the internet is said out loud in a room full of people you don't know. It is not private. It is not between you and your friends. It is said out loud in front of other people. So you have to understand that if you're doing that, perhaps if you want to have a conversation about something, how you would do that in a group of friends, like how you would approach that. Like, Hey, I was thinking about this and I would love to talk about this. Like we wouldn't go into a room full of people and just be like, fuck this lettuce. Like no one would say that in a grocery store, you know? Mm -hmm. So I always approach it that way. Like everything you say on the internet is out loud. So, um, I think it's important to have conversations, but we tend to, I think that the internet has robbed us of our ability to have a conversation sometimes with like nuance and context and, being able to like understand each other, mm-hmm. we tend to like sit in defense of our position and want to attack rather than um, like understand, which yeah, is, you know, something. problematic. You, I, I feel like you have to go into things with an open mind because if you don't mm-hmm. have an open mind, then you're not going to go anywhere. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's hard though, too. Like sometimes it's hard to have an open mind. Like you've been oppressed or you've been you know spoken down to long enough that you just don't want to have to hear it you shouldn't have to be the bigger person like i get it it's hard for everybody i think contextually you do what you can and hopefully the people that can do more do a little bit more and the people to to fill in the space for the people that just don't have it in them do you get what i'm saying like we all just try to help each other like you don't have space for that i got you i have space for this odd this conversation like it's i feel like life is a group effort and i wish that more people approached it like that yeah, which brings me actually good. Way- that was a very, very heavy conversation. What are your takes in in reviews? Like, because you, I mean, They're you go business. into a reviews to where some are putting their opinion on if they like the book or not, or some are saying they loved it. Like, what are your views on reviews? They're none of my business. That's my view on it. It's absolutely none of my business. Like, that's for reviewers, and I, I don't, I don't. Um, I don't tone police. I don't, and I don't uh, have an opinion about how they give it. If they want to like bash it and be like, this was a dumpster fire. I hated it. Shittiest writing of all time. That's your business. I, it's literally not my side of the street. It's none of my business. When I wrote the book, I knew what I wanted to write. I spoke to the people that I wanted to know their opinion about. 
And after that, that's for you guys to talk about because someone who thinks I'm a dumpster fire is going to tell that to other people that like their reviews. And those people are not going to read, which is probably good because then they would probably consider me a dumpster fire too, because they like, like, you know what I mean? Like it's a rare occasion that if somebody says, I hated this book, that all of their readers pick it up and go, you're wild. I loved it. No, they read samesies. So it's as helpful to me for someone to say, I hated it as it is for someone to say, I loved it. Not my business at all. I don't look at them. People tag me in them. I never read them. I, mm-hmm. listen i'm sorry like they tag me i will st- i will literally when they tag me on instagram i write past and go heart 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 i don't even know what it says it could be like she's a piece of shit i don't know i'm just like heart 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 like i i want to make because if they tag me they want me to notice it so i give them their notice mm-hmm. but i don't read them ever because they are literally none of my reviews you guys can decide as reviewers like in that community you can decide what's right and what's wrong the appropriate way, the inappropriate way that like, that's for you guys to decide. That's for your counsel counsel. Do you know what I mean? That's not for me. I'm not in the, that's not my fight. <laughs> yeah. But I know you guys scrap, you girls so like, I scrap about it, but it's none of my business. Like it's really none of my business. No. And I, I agree with what you said. Cause I know there's times where, I mean, I personally don't go by reviews anymore. Like I don't go in Goodreads and read reviews to see if I'm going to read a book. Like I'll read the book if I feel like I want to read it. Like I go to the blurb and yeah. I well, don't- also Goodreads is so unregulated, right? They let everything stand. Like there are reviews on my books right now about a different book. Like somebody mentions what? the title. It's not my title. They're different things. They gave it a one-star review. They hated that book. I mean, God bless them. You hated it. They really hated it. And it stuck <laughs> on my book. But Goodreads won't remove it. They just won't remove it. And I'm like, okay, cool. There's another person that um, said I plagiarized a story and then put a link for their story and and was like, you should read it. It's right here. You can see the plagiarism. It was their Wattpad story. They were just trying to like filter people into their Wattpad story. And it's a complete, they wrote a mafia story. That's on Filthy Little Pretties, by the way. And it's not even a gossip girl kind of story. And it was to a mafia story. Goodreads won't remove it. So like they, they legitimately just don't regulate what happens there. And they tell you, and I'm also not ever allowed to like comment on it and be like, but that's not for my book. Like, I can't say that they will slap my hand. They will close me down. They will make it so I can't. So you can't like, I did that once. And then because they're affiliated with Amazon, I'm not allowed to review on Amazon anymore now. Like they banned me for life. I can't leave a review on Amazon because I commented this is not my book. Why would you like, please remove this review. And they slapped my hand. That was my, that was my punishment for life. So they punish us, but they don't punish reviews. Like you can just say whatever you want. Doesn't matter. Yeah. That's crazy though. So it's like the wild, wild west over there. So I don't go there. And I also don't think it's, um, it's a real record of like reviews because people also one star reviews before you even, um, like how would they read it? How would they know? Um, They do like they just don't regulate it. So I think that it's an um, it's unreliable. Good reasons unreliable because people also write reviews. They have found that if they write very critical or like they say really mean things, that it gets them more followers. Mm-hmm. So now they don't even read the books. They just look through the reviews and they pick highlights, and then they just like tear your 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 book apart. And it's a common practice. So you can't always um, that feels unreliable. Book book bit more reliable like those that um that Mm -hmm. site and uh amazon so yeah i don't go there but you know it's true about goodreads because i forgot which book it was i went to add a book on my um what is it called when you i I guess as you want to read like when your tbr yeah and one it one of the books that it didn't come out until late this year was earlier this year and there was a one review star and the comment was, um, what did it say? I think it said, I didn't want this character's book. And it was a one star review. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, I like the basis of Goodreads, like when people can say, I'm giving this book one star and I DNF'd it. Like, you don't know what happened. After. Like I DNF'd it 30%. What if you would have liked the last seven? You don't know, and you're a lot, and like you reviewed the book, like you gave it the review. I think that in general, and I get why people do that, but at the same time, I think that that is the that just like shows like the unregulation of Goodreads just drives me nutty. So I think I 
DNF'd one book, two books max since I started reading, but I didn't leave reviews on it. Right. I I DNF books all the time. I also don't review books at all, but like, I mean, I have my reviews up here, but like, I don't actually put (laughs) reviews on ever, you know? Because what I read may not be what somebody else wants to read. And then they're just going to take my word for it. It feels unfair. Like, they'll take my word for it a little bit. If I say, this is a book that I want to read, everyone's like, oh, I should go and buy that. It feels like a power play. Like, I'm I'm doing something, like, like deceptive to my audience. But this is my personal taste. So mm-hmm. I don't I don't review them. And I feel like me and Ping have always said, like, because me and Ping, it's weird. We have the same taste on, like, books that we read. But um, it's like what we like might not be what somebody else likes, and what they yeah, like all may not be what we like. Yeah. Listen, I love a vampire book all day, every day. Like, give me vampires all day, every day. I would read the back to back to back to back, the terrible ones, the good ones. I don't care. I'll read them all. But people might not like that. Do you know what I mean? Like, I can't recommend a thousand like vampire books. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna need that recommendation list from you. <laughs> oh my gosh, I have so many. I love them so much. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's so hard for me to find books like vampire books for me to read. I love them. I am a twihard, like forever and ever. Even though it, I'm embarrassed to admit, I used to be a twihard in the midnight showings in line. But me too. <laughs> I had a Team Edward T-shirt. Yeah. I- so I need those recommendations on my inbox. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? They don't like, not a lot of people write great ones. Like no offense, to all the people. I'm not. You write one, you write one. You should write one. Right one. <laughs> you should write one. Want, maybe. I mean, I want like, a, you know what I want? I want like a good, like contemporary, you know, like Twilight, but like, I want it to be like, like college, like secrets is like arrogant, like maybe an English guy in there. Like I want it to be a little grittier. Does that make sense? So like that's, that's what I want. So the next question, how much world building takes place before you start? Um, that's a good question, Peg. <laughs> <laughs> um, not, oh, well, okay. So the development all happens in my mind. So I see everything like a movie. So like I start to always envision like the opening of a book and I always know how it's going to end. So when I sit down to write, I write the end first because I know where I'm going. And then I go all the way back to the beginning and I start. And so a lot of times it's more like conversations that happen. So it's like a feeling or like an aesthetic in my head. So I imagine like how they're speaking to each other, like different moments in the book but I don't necessarily sit down and world build. Like that happens because I'm a panster. That kind of happens as it goes. And sometimes I have to go back and like, like no, I'm going to change this up and make it bigger, or, like make it less, like whatever. But like when I wrote Tangled and Tinsel, I knew how it was going to end, like what they were going to say at the very end. So I wrote that. And then I knew how it was beginning. Like she was sitting in a room doing the tree. They were rich. I had a cabin in mind. Like I had had it kind of like, Play, like it plays like a movie like that it kind of played like on a, re- on a reel like in my head over and over what was happening in the beginning of that scene like I could picture the opening and the guys walking in like one by one you know and then I also had the scene when they all joined for the first time um it was like a, in my head it was like because my I could hear my son always playing like NFL Madden you know and they're always introducing the characters right <laughs> and so it was like it felt like a Madden game it would be like the introduction like coming in next number 32 <laughs> blah 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 like, like, and so I was picturing like that like coming in next so that's why I introduced them one at a time and they all had the kind of a tagline at the end when they would walk in or something big would happen like Reed was like where's my you know where's my dirty slut daddy's here like because I was like introducing them like Madden players, like in my head, because I was hearing Madden. So that's how the world building happens. It's it's more like in the shower conversations or um, like things like that, where it just kind of creates a vibe mm-hmm. for me, for who these people are and how they would live their life. And I feel, and they are always very real, like very realistic. Like if I picture it, like as if I'm in it, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. It's weird, but that's how I picture it. That's how the world building goes. That's kind of every author, the way from all the authors that we've interviewed, their world building 
everyone takes world building differently. And mm-hmm. I seriously think yours is really unique. <laughs> so should we read the ending first before we start? <laughs> never, <laughs> never, never. Because you never know what's going to happen at the end. Like I could be like, I mean, if you read just like Heaven's ending, it's a huge cliffhanger. You would be, mm-hmm. you'd have anxiety the whole yeah. time. Like sweating the whole time. Like I know it's coming. Like it would be terrible. But I mean, the ending for me is more like I need to have it on paper. It's almost like a, a point on the map, like my mm-hmm. true north. And so I, I can re- reference back to it a lot of times because I write it. It's so visceral in my head all the time that I can like, it's so vivid. And so I can write it and I know exactly what they're feeling. So I can make sure as I'm going through the story that I'm building to the correct emotion. Mm-hmm. Because that's what I feel at the end. Mm-hmm. But if you come on, if I were to write it backwards and write it from the beginning, in, in my head it's backwards, if I write from the beginning to the end, mm-hmm. I'm not sure the ending would be the same. Like, just like Heaven's ending was there. Mm-hmm. And Sinning Like Hell's ending was there. And I had to write, like, I knew where I was in the story because I knew the ending. You know what yeah. I mean? So that's kind of like how I approach every story. Yeah, the world building is always like, I see it in my head a lot. Like I daydream a lot for like days, sometimes weeks. Um, I just sit in my office and like swirl around in my chair. My husband's like, are you going to write? And I'm like, Shh, sh- I'm working. Like, and he's like, okay. Or I'll like lay on the couch with like just music on. I play a lot of records. And so I'll just put music on and I'll just stare at the ceiling. And I just let myself kind of drift into a world where I'm legitimately like an eight year old, just like daydreaming an entire world. And I have patients in my head of these people and sometimes I don't even know it. Like my husband will come in and be like, you're talking to yourself. And I'm like, my bad, my bad. Like <laughs> I'm just kind of like living in the world for a minute and having conversations the way they would have them. I'm going to admit, I did read the ending of Sinning Like Hell first when I started the book. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you. Uh, I'm sorry. The way it ended, it was a surprise. The way, the way just like have it, just like have it ended. Like you cannot tell me. Like I literally was dying for what? Like was it two months? I know, but it's so emotional. And then you read it, you knew, and you were like, "Oh my god!" And then you tried again. You got I the just end. needed to know they both were alive. So then after I read that, I was like, "Okay, let me go back and start again." <laughs> Did you read like the full? I read, I think it was like the last page, just that one page. I didn't read like the whole last <laughs> chapter, like chapter. Right. It's just that one page. I had to. I could not not read it. It's really emotional though. Like so, yeah. I love it. It was a beautiful read. I'm so glad that I wrote it. But and I don't want to say never again, but it was it's really almost a never again. That love that duet. Um, and that's also my personality. Like once I feel like I did something like, and I could never beat it. Like I could never best it. I'm like, that's the best it's going to get. I'm going to leave that there forever. Like I don't like that duet for me is so, um, it sits on a pedestal. I feel like it's really good writing for me. I feel like it's super like amazing emotion. I, I poured my heart into it. I bled on those pages and I'm, and I feel like, all right, that stands on its own. That's going to be there forever. That's the that's the crown of this, like that's the jewel of this crown. Like, and that's it. And I just leave it. So, I'm... series. I'll never write another part of that series. But I don't know if I'll ever write a duet like that again either. I'll do it. I just like I've been wanting to reread it ever since I talked to you in Vegas. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm gonna reread it before the year's over. Like I've reread that duet like I think three times already. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, that's amazing. <laughs> but that's amazing. going back to Tangled and Tinsel, I have to ask, because there has to be one, one hero that stood out to you the most when you were writing. I have a favorite. Who is your favorite and why? I can't tell. No, you <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell. How can I tell you who my favorite kid is? Come on, I, I gave birth to all these boys. Like, how could I pick who my favorite is? That's wrong. That's wrong and terrible. I could never, but I do have a favorite. And if you know my personality at all, if you really dig deep, you probably already know, like somewhere. But I can tell you who everybody else's favorite is because in the back of the book, there's a little page that says, if you like this guy, then you'll like this book. 
And I can tell you who the public's favorite is because I can tell from the read throughs, like what books are getting picked up. I can tell you that Cole is the absolute commercial favorite. Like that's the world's favorite right there. <laughs> um, because the read through for Cole, every the read through for that mafia series is through the roof. Cause that's where I direct people is straight to <laughs> the mafia series. If you like Cole, because you know, the mafia guys, they own that sex club. So they're like, woo. Yeah. And then I can tell you the second favorite and it, it bounces back and forth. And some people are like, no, Jace was my second favorite, but the world's second favorite is Reed because Hillcrest, shoo, everybody's picking up Hillcrest to try to read about Reed. And then the, and he's not even in the books, but like it's his personality, right? And the third favorite is Jace and then poor Alex at the bottom. That's how it seems to go for like the- Why, He's my favorite. Like the Alec is your favorite? <laughs> I know, I like him too, actually. Yeah. But I don't know he's, why he's, he was just like, I don't know, like I loved him. I thought from all of the four boys, like he's the one to me that's for me stood out the most. I was like, I love him. Because <laughs> he's so like steady. Yeah. So protective. Like he was like, if you're gonna be scared or you're gonna be nervous, like you look at me. And there's something so daddy about that, right? Like he felt like a zaddy, not a daddy. So <laughs> Like I, I, I love them, but you're wrong. People can like moms can have favorite. I'm my mom's favorite. <laughs> I mean, I'll let you guess. It's between if I were to give you two, because everyone always thinks it's cold for me. I don't know why. I must give like like aggressive energy, but like <laughs> I think it's either Cole. I'll give you a choice between Cole. It's not Alec. I'll tell you that much. It's not Alec. He's not my favorite, but that doesn't mean that I don't love him. I love him. But Alec's not my favorite. It's between like Jace Reed or Cole. I'm going to go with Reed. What do you think, Peng? Maybe Jace. I think Jace. Interesting. It's one of those two. <laughs> okay, so if you want to answer, tell me what you liked most about each one. Okay. Um, I love a man who knows how to please a woman and is so confident about pleasing a woman that he could spit on her clit and say it's mine and he knows it's his. So that's my favorite thing about Cole. Like there is no apology. He is resolute in his decisions and I love a resolute man, okay? Um, I love any guy who uh, can charm the panties off of anybody that like you could, um, that you know that he's probably a player and he probably slept with someone last night. He's going to sleep with somebody different tomorrow, but you're still going to sleep with him tonight. That's Reed. Um, like I love good banter. Like he gives the banter like back and forth. He'll give you exactly what you're giving. And oof, that's like to die. And then, I mean, who doesn't like a guy with tattoos and piercings that looks like he could kill you, but is a cinnamon <laughs> roll. You know what I mean? That's Jace. Like he's going to be a guy who probably owns a guitar He's a guy that like marches for women's rights. He probably has a sticker on like a backpack somewhere that he camps with that says, I'm a feminist. Like that's Jace. Do you know what I mean? Like that's him. Like get your rights, girl. Get your right. Like he's that girl. He's that guy. Like he's a, he's like a girl's guy, you know, like he wants to protect us and love us. And he also looks like he would kill someone. So that's amazing. Um, and then there's Alec and everyone needs an Alec in their life in that I feel like, and I didn't realize it at the time. But I think that the reason he's not my favorite in the book is I think I have him in real life. Not that my husband's a lawyer. Don't take that the wrong way. <laughs> but like, he is salt and pepper. He's six foot four. We used to call him um, Clark Kent because he reminded us because he wears glasses. And I was like, it's like Superman before he's like when he's in disguise. That's what we used to call him. And then I described Alec as looking like Superman with salt and pepper. Mm. And I was like, did I just describe my <laughs> <husband>? <laughs> Whoops. Like, so, um, so, you know, that's Alec in real life. So I don't have to, I don't have to, he doesn't have to be my favorite, but um, I will tell you that my husband has Reed's personality. So, <clears throat> so Jen did mention that we don't really read our H. H is not really our, the type of books that we pick up. Yeah. So for you, what is one thing? What is it about our age that you like the most? I'd never read it either before this book. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had never. And so when I wrote the book, I was like, I should probably do a little bit of research, but it wasn't, I couldn't find anything was, that was like what I was writing. So it was not helpful. And I 
picked up some, a lot of people recommended the, um, the Tate James, like Madison Kate series. And I ended up picking up the same book. Cause I thought, Oh, they're probably having sex by now. Like I'll kind of like flip through and just see how they do it. Cause I didn't know how they do it. Like everybody, you know what I mean? I was like, I don't know how they do this thing. Like how descriptive they, like, is it, mm -hmm. am I about to like do something totally stupid and it's like against the rules? So I wanted to make sure that I was doing that. And um, I got so sucked into that series that I read the whole series. Cause I was like, who's trying to kill this girl. This is amazing. Like what's happening right now. Is she, if I didn't know it was going to happen. Do you know what I mean? Sucked in, never read the first book, read all the rest of them like a dummy. Um, and it was unhelpful to what I was doing. Cause I did something <laughs> totally the opposite. So I just had to kind of create it on my own and I don't have any plans on like reading RH again. Not that I don't like it or like mm -hmm. reading a white shoes. I, I, lo I loved it. It was great, but I mean, I like, in my personal taste, I like a good, like, asshole that, um, like, that enemies to lovers, but not necessarily. I mean, I love, like, the power dynamic where, like, it's, like, a boss and, like, an employee kind of, like, where you're, like, the power dynamic's weird. Or it's, like, um, like, any guy that will, like, you know, a stud in college and, like, she's, like, she reads you know what i mean like that kind of dynamic like i love that where she like isn't putting up with his bullshit but he also is trying to like put his bullshit on her i i'm a, I'm a hoe for that like all day all day all night so that's what i usually read um that in like vampires because mm -hmm. i just love some people getting bitten apparently i don't know what's wrong with you but like <laughs> <laughs> and so i that stuff like a good high school book like mm -hmm. give me a high school romance every day all day because i want to be 17 in my head again so i'm like take me back take me back take me back you know i'm not sexualizing teenagers which is what everybody's always like why do you want to read a high school book i'm like i'm not thinking about them like really like, i pick my daughter from school every day you don't think i know what they look like Dumb it. Dumb it. Dumb it. like stop it like nobody's doing that weirdos <laughs> <But> like, <laughs> I'm reading it because I'm going back in time, you know, and like, I'm picturing myself like, woohoo, you know? So I love a good high school romance, like give it to me all day long or like even a college romance. I love that too. Yeah. I mean, I, but I don't, I read a lot of like thrillers though, like of my own also like Stephen King or like suspense books. Like I like those. And I do want to ask you this just because I mean, I, you, read um you wrote tangled in tinsel what do you think it's about the white shoes our age that people like the most because i feel like now i'm in groups where it's like you should write our age like i see comments in groups all the time to where you should write our age you should write our age like what is it about that what do you think that it's about that trope that like people love so much because i've never i in my opinion i don't see it as it may, like I've said this before and I'm like please people don't like come after me like I don't necessarily <laughs> see it as a romance in my because right. I romance to me is between two people like you know those two are the only ones in the relationship that's romance whatever like what I mean, what's your opinion on that I think that the romance, I think there are different types of romances that you can read. Do you know what I mean? Like, I mean, I think that people consider the note, like if you watch the notebook right on T, like you've seen the movie, that was a book first. People consider that a romance novel, um, but it's not a romance novel necessarily because it's supposed to blend into the happily ever after and it doesn't necessarily end in heaven and sending like hell. I'm not giving, I'm not giving it away. It is a romance novel, but it also ends in a different kind of way sometimes, right? Like, and I think that because you take people through people's lives or whatever, I think that that's women's fiction more, right? Sometimes you can break the rules as long as you give people that love story, right? Like that, that they're in, I feel like I gave the ending of just like heaven away and I'm mad about that. But anyway, <laughs> it's fine. Um, but it's, uh, I also think that, uh, that, this there could be other kind of romances in that um there are more kind of i don't want to say erotica because that's fair but i also think that that can be a romance like i think that romance doesn't always have to be about love mm -hmm. um i think that it can be a shared experience between people that lead to love later kind of like how i wrote in tangled and tinsel where we don't go through their whole entire like from where they got together to like how they went through all their trials and tribulations to be in love. I don't think you need to, I don't need to do that all right. Like I just kind of jumped ahead to let you know that they were together so that it ends in a happily ever after. And you know that they're the knowledge of that makes it a romance. But I think that for this 
particular genre, um, what it satisfies is keeping women in a spotlight. Mm -hmm. And there's something very intoxicating to women about being the only one, um, about having men want to put you in the spotlight and kind of worship you and kind of you in the, like you are the center of that universe. And I think a lot of us in life don't get to experience um, being the center of someone's universe, whether it's one person or four that you're reading. But if you haven't experienced being the center of one person's universe, then how, how enthralling it would be to be the center of four people's universe. And if you have experienced being the center of one person's universe, how enthralling it is to know how intoxicating being the center of four people's universe would be. And so I think that it's kind of like, that's the common denominator is that it just puts us in the spotlight, like mm. really like, shining down on us. And they're all looking at us like, that's it. No, nobody's looking anywhere. And these like four hot billionaire guys all want you like you are the be all end all. And I think that that can be a romance too. And an orthodox, I think that it satisfies the idea that, um, the feeling of being loved is still there, even though it's unorthodox. Like you're walking away with the feeling of just being over, like just being, you know, suffocated with love. And that's what we're reading for is like, is to feel that feeling or to relive it or to, you know, add to the experience that we're having in our own personal lives. We're all reading to feel that love, that sexual attraction, that um, essence of being the most important person in another person's life. And I think that that just fills it in buckets. And that's why people like it. You know, I never thought about it like that. And it's true because I feel like everybody wants that feeling of being wanted. And I feel like yeah. these books are more of a, you're wanted by multiple men. And it gives you that thrill and that satisfaction of, oh my God, like yeah. I am wanted. I am, you know, um, you get that feeling and I get, I get what you're saying. And it's true. I mean, think about what a high it would be if you walked into a room and there were like, you know, a bunch of guys there or whatever. And they all were just like, what can I get you? You want another drink? You want something to eat? And they were just like, and you were like, what's happening? <laughs> and all, there were other women around. There were other people. You would be like, love this party. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I mean, anyone would be like, this is a, the best Friday night of my life, you know? <laughs> so I think it just kind of like heightens it and, and you experience it more in the idea that these people could then break the mold. I think that that is something that people love the idea of, like just breaking the mold where, you know, not everybody lives an ideal life where it's like, they're just the, the you know, the norm of like, you want to want me and I'm going to want you. And we're, you know, not everybody has that where they get to like find a partner, blah, blah, blah. Like, so it's nice to know that like you can read a book where people break the norm and they're just like, I want you. And it's not about that norm. Like it doesn't necessarily mean that you want to have a poly relationship or anything like that. It just means that it's exciting to read something where people are willing to sacrifice, you know, looks or people thinking that that's not cool or whatever, like that they're willing to like be like, fuck it, we're going to do it. Like, cause this is important. It's that kind of feeling. Like I'm willing to make the sacrifice with like, I'm willing to make that sacrifice. I'm willing to like go through all the trials and tribulations because I want you. And I think that's nice, you know, like to feel that. It's a nice thrill, you can say as well. Yeah. Um, and it's, and, and I want to go back to what you said, something where the notebook, I do consider it a love story because they died. I know me. most people do. <laughs> Technically though, it's pretty fiction. It's like, and I've said this before, like my first romance was A Walk to Remember. Now, if you right. look at it now in days, I'm like, that was like, would it's I? Women's fiction. Right. Romance? Uh, I don't think I would because she died. Right. And then he's by himself right. or whatever. So it's like, I do look at those books and I'm, and I'm like, was it a love story? That's why when they're like, which one was your first romance book that you read? I'm like, well, my favorite book that I've read will always be A Walk to Remember because that's like the first book I've ever read. Right. That wasn't in school, like a school. Right. Book. Um, but I feel like the first romance book I read was um, The Coincidence of Callie and Caden because that was a full on romance. Right. So it is, I do agree with what you said, but the notebook that you died together. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I 
And I think that that can be considered a romance because they die together, right? Like they're together, still together. And I think that the only reason that kind of works and feels like a romance is because he takes you through their whole life, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's the only way you can kind of do that is that you can go through their whole life. But I do think that there are lots of movies and that are books that people consider romances and they break the rules all the time. They do. And so I think that, you know, sometimes we get caught up Sometimes we get so caught up in the rules and like the trope, like it's supposed to follow this rule because it's this trope. We get so caught off and like caught up in that, that we cut ourselves off from the experience that we could have with just a creative story that we're reading. Mm -hmm. If you get too caught up in it, you lose, like you lose the fun of just, you know, accepting something that somebody's giving you. And I, and I, and I will tell you that like so many people, if you go up to so many people and they tell you and you ask them, what is your favorite romance book? And they say in Nicholas Sparks, it is so different than the books that we are reading now. Right. That it's actual romance because you're like, well, that's not really romance. Like, have you? Nicholas Sparks it? kills everybody. Everybody breaks up and everybody <laughs> dies. In book. Like, it's not a romance. He writes women's fiction, but like, they're always like, that's a, my romance. That's my romance. Yeah. And his books are categorized on Amazon, like, as romance too. Mm -hmm. But if you go into Barn. Yeah, it's 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 wild. Man. No, sorry, Nicholas. Romances to you, I just I'm fine with like I'm fine with breaking rules. Like I'm fine with people just giving me a creative story that I'm gonna eat up because I'm open to the idea of just like falling in love with characters, and I'm open to the idea of you presenting me a love story in like different ways because mm -hmm. I think there are so many love stories to tell, and he is considered a love story, not necessarily a romance novel. Yeah, because there are two different categorizations. You know. You true. Sorry, Nicholas Sparks. Am I breaking up or are you breaking up? <laughs> um, I, I think Jan, you're somewhat breaking up. Oh, my back. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's just kind of like where I sit with it. Is I think that, but I'm I'm open to love stories and romance novels and the whole deal. I think that part of the fun of it, though, is like reading creative stories and just kind of like soaking them up like i take them but not everybody does that and that's fine too but i take them for what you give me like if you give me the story like i just enjoy the story you're giving me and i never have any like rule set to it but i get wanting to walk in and know that it's a happily ever after like some for some people that's very important so i get the categorization so I from do. all from all the books that you've written what has been your favorite tangled in tinsel like hands down because it was fun. like I laughed the whole time I was writing it like I had fun writing it and I wasn't exhausted after writing it and I like I was like I want to write another one like I was all stoked and you know it's been like a fun process and um and I got to write about four guys fucking one girl like, <laughs> <laughs> like it was and like the jokes were making me laugh like I was writing I was like I hope people think this is funny <laughs> like I was laughing myself so like that's been the most fun to write um, just like the heaven and hell duet was stressful, like nobody's business, but also felt very gratifying at the end, but I was so stressful mm -hmm. and, you know, the mafia series, I was just getting my feet wet. So I didn't really know. I really liked, um, the Hillcrest prep series. So that like made me really happy because I like those characters. I was just bummed that, um, people didn't like Caroline as much as I liked her. I liked her and you know, okay. Well, in the first, it's got the worst read through people don't want to read it because they hate her so much. They don't think she's really cool. <laughs> Well, see, in the first book, I, I will I will say when I was reading, I was like, oh, my gosh, she's horrible. She's such a bitch. Like, what the heck is going on? But then I read her book and I felt bad for her. Like, I uh -huh. wanted to jump in there and protect her. And I'm like, I yeah. freaking love her. Like, yeah. what is like, I don't know. Like, I felt like people and I say this because she was like super mean. And I was like, people are judging her like so bad. And it's like, <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> You don't know her. You don't know her. No. Like, that's the thing, though, is, like, I tell people all the time, and then when I say it, they're like, whoa, wait. She's the only character in both books that tells the truth all the time. Every one of them lies in between different things. Kai, Gray, Liam, Donovan, they all lie at one point or another and do, like, underhanded things. Caroline's the only one that tells the truth throughout all the books. But, you know, and I think that's why I like her, because I'm sort of like her. Like, I have no filter. Like, if I... If I'm telling you the truth, I'm going to tell you the truth. And yeah. people are like, well, you're mean. I'm like, how is that mean? Like, I'm being truthful and I'm telling you straight out 
the way things are. And if, I mean, I, it's the truth. How is saying the truth mean? And I felt with her, it's like she would just spit out stuff like straight out. Yeah. And it was the truth. And people were like, she's horrible. She's so dis- like she's rude. And I'm like, and then when you read her book, you're like, okay, but did she lie? Did she lie? Right. No, the truth is just hard to hear. Yeah. People don't like it. And I'll also tell you what that taught me though about readers is that, um, and I'm not saying all, so I don't want to, ge- I'm going to generalize, but I'm not meaning to, gen- I'm not putting every, so everybody listening, I'm not <laughs> like, I'm saying, I'm going to say like you and readers and blah, 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 but I don't mean every single reader. A lot of readers um, say things like, I love strong women, but what they mean is they love women that will cut their nose off to spite their face. Mm -hmm. that they know they shouldn't make a decision, but they do it anyway just to be spiteful because they're like, you're not going to tell me. But really, that's immaturity. Maturity is going, that's probably not a good idea. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. But they want her to make that shitty decision and walk out even though she knows she's going to get kidnapped on the street because she's like, you can't tell me what to do. They're like, yeah, yeah, don't let him tell you what to do. She's about to get fucking kidnapped. Like, (laughs) immature bitch, sit down. You're about to die. Like, And everyone's like, I love her. She's so fierce. Her ass got herself kidnapped. What are you <laughs> talking about? Like, but everyone's like, she's so feisty. She's not feisty. She's dumb as fuck. Like, and I like him too. And that's the thing is I like him too. I'm like, yes. And then I'm like, she's going to get kidnapped. Like, I love him. <laughs> but, like, but like people will confuse that with strong. And that's not strong. That's immature. Mm-hmm. We like a bitch that will do dumb shit that we can get behind <laughs> just because we know it's going to create drama. But if you give them someone who actually creates drama, they're like, ew, I hate you. Because it either has happened to them by somebody or it's a mirror. Yeah. And we don't like to look at ourselves. Like if you show them a character who gets cheated on and actually breaks down in a book, they will hate her just a little bit because they're like, stop being so weak because we don't like to read ourselves in a mm. book. We like to read things that we might have done. We like to hear somebody pop off when they shouldn't because we know what we really should do, but we want to hear her pop off anyway because we wanted to pop off. Mm-hmm. We want to hear her you know, get cheated on and then stand up and burn all his clothes and and bash all the windows because that's what we wanted to do. But what we really did was what she did in the book, which was cry. Yeah. We don't want to read that. It feels too, it's too hard because we're reading ourselves. So we don't want to read ourselves. We like to escape it. Women will hate on real women in books a hundred times out of a hundred times. And I'm always fascinated by that because I do it too. So don't be mad at me readers. I do it too. But like, (laughs) But like, it really does happen. And so what I found with Caroline is that people really hated her because she was saying what was true Mm -hmm. and ruining the fantasy. Yeah. And so they were like, bitch. And I was like, truth teller, (laughs) not bitch, truth teller. You just don't like her because she's telling the truth. (laughs) Like, and so it was like, you know, and she caused a little bit of trouble, but they were accountable for their actions. She didn't have to do anything. She just made a statement. Mm-hmm. And they were like, let me go ruin my life. And everybody was like, <laughs> did she though? And they were like, I'm off to ruin the day. Like, and so nobody got mad at Gray. Nobody ever got mad at Gray for all the dumb stuff he did. They just yeah. got mad at Caroline for play- for like saying a sentence. That's what? Like, so it always <laughs> amazed me because I was like, okay, girls, like, do we know that we are being misogynist sometimes in books? Just saying. Like, yeah. but <laughs> we do we do and and i always think about that when i'm writing a character like um when someone's like oh i loved her she's so feisty and i always think to myself she is immature as a mother but you love her (laughs) like (laughs) i would never eat kidnapped in real life like you were gonna make the worst decisions (laughs) (laughs) but you know it's fun in fiction it's it's more fun to read how like if if some guy said something to me that i didn't want him to say and i was like i'm gonna punch you and i actually punched him in the face well, that's great. So I love to read that. I'm like, yeah, hit him. <laughs> like, I love it. But I'm not going to do that in real life because in real life, I'm probably going to end up in the hospital because he's seven times my size. You know what I mean? Like, not a smart decision. Walk away. Like, think of your safety. You know? But if I write a girl thinking about her safety, they're like, weak bitch, you should have punched him. You know what I, mean? <laughs> yeah. I get it. I totally get it. But, you know, it, it brings, it, it taught me a whole bunch of stuff like that when I was going through the book. When you were writing the first book, did you know Liam was going to end up with Caroline though? I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How was that? Because I feel like the way you did Liam in the first book, I I like, I, and it's weird because I loved him. And then in the second book, I was like, you're an asshole. Like I, I hate you. But how was it developing that character? So I feel like we saw two different sides of him, maybe because we got more inside his head in the second book. Because you saw him through gray and Donovan's eyes. Yeah. So you saw him through their perspective and from their perspective, that's who he is. Like 
who he is to Gray. I mean, who we are as people, like who I am to you is maybe not who I am to Peng. You know what I mean? Like we can be somebody's like, you can be the villain and the hero to two different people. So like how Donovan and Gray saw the him was, you know, their best friend and they love him unconditionally, right? And that's how they saw him. And they also knew him so well and they knew him as a part of their threesome in yeah. a sense. Like not threesome, but like, well, <laughs> chapter 13, but like still like <laughs> in, in the in the like threesome, you know, like as their like little musketeer group. Yeah. Yeah. So he was like, a, he was an intricate part, an integral part of their group. And so how Caroline sees him is outside of that dynamic. So now you're seeing him in a different light. Like this is a different Liam because she knows him as someone different. She knows him, <clears throat> she knows him deeper and she knows the real, like not the real, cause he is real with Gray and Donovan, but like she knows the underbelly of who he is that he hides from everyone else. There were times and where now, I he was using Caroline though. Like he was, I was like, 100%. he was like, he claimed to be this guy who, did knew from right from wrong who did everything right and i'm like you're like the shittiest <laughs> like you were just really really lost like for someone we've known people like that that seem to have it all together they seem to be perfect on the outside and they have a perfect instagram and their hair is perfect and they're always posting incredible pictures and they seem so like everything is like look at this that i got and look at this that i got and they seem to have a perfect life. And then all of a sudden something happens and all of the, like the, the mirror comes down, like it just splatters and you realize that they're a fucking mess, just like everyone else. But for whatever reason, they're horrified to show what a mess they are. Like they're not brave enough to show what a mess they are. And that was Liam's problem. He wasn't brave at all. Yeah. And he was totally afraid of who he was. He was totally afraid of owning who he was. And he was, but Caroline knew that and loved him anyway. Yeah. And she waited for him to be brave enough. And then when she had enough, she had enough. And that's what makes them so great is that in the moments in which she was scared, she was always brave enough to be who she was. But at the same time, she punished herself for who she was. Do you get what I'm saying? Because everyone hated sometimes who she was. So she would punish herself for that. And he allowed her to be exactly who she is without punishment. And she allowed him to be as weak as he needed to be knowing that she would be strong for him. So they complimented each other in a way they needed each other. There was no other way. And I always knew that about them from the start, but he had to be a piece of shit because people that aren't brave, a lot of times to the people around them end up being a piece of shit. Yeah. And they don't mean to be, but they can't stop themselves until they fix it. And he fixed it. Is he played a role as his life was like the per like picture perfect. He's the golden and boy. Yeah, and it's like when you get to their book, you're like, he is a shitty person. He's not who he says he is. He is like treating Caroline like crap, and she's like taking it. And that I think that's what hurt me the most because you're like, girl, you're this strong female, like get it together. But then you see them both finding each other halfway, you could say, and learning to accept their truth of how they are. Well, it was, if there was anyone that was going to be empathetic towards him, it would have been Caroline mm -hmm. because she understands what it's like to crumble under like the pressures around you and how to not ever be able to be authentically who you are. And so she forgave him a lot of stuff, not because she was weak, but because she was empathetic. She understood it because she did it in her own life. She cut herself. She, her mother said terrible things to her. Like there were a lot of things that she would like crumble to and take out on herself. And she just understood that Liam did that exact same thing to him, to himself in a different way. And so they were, they were kind of similar in that way. And she, there was only one person that could understand that. And it was her. And so it was, it was interesting because I don't think anyone made the correlation. Like at the very end of the book, everyone in Filthy Little Pretties, a, a couple of people got like, just a little bit irritated, not irritated, but they were like, I thought that Liam being so angry at Gray was like, he should have gotten over it. He should have gotten over it. Like she always was in love with Gray. That was obvious. Like he, he should have gotten over it faster. He shouldn't have given Gray so much shit. Like he was throwing a temper tantrum and he acted like a baby. But now when you go read the second book, you realize that was never about Donovan. That was always his anger inside about watching his friend do the exact same thing that he had done to Caroline. And he didn't want him to repeat the same foot. Like he knew that he wanted Caroline so bad. And he couldn't do the right thing. So now to watch his friend throw away a chance that like he threw away, he was fucking angry at him for that. 
he was like, don't do that. You're the better version of us. Like between them two, like between the pronouns, like you're the better version of us. You have to do this. So it was like, once you go and read the second one, you realize why he got so mad. Cause it was like a trigger. How did you come up with the idea of that whole, those two books, that duet? Because I, I feel like you said earlier, it is like a, I grew up with Gossip Girl, One Tree Hill, like all those scene dramas, like I love them. Um, if I hear a book, it's like, oh, you know, if you love Gossip Girl, read this. And I think that's how I found it on <laughs> Amazon. I read a review and it said, the first thing it said, if you're a fan of Gossip Girl, right, you should pick this up. And I was like, ooh, God, like, I love Gossip Girl. Like, I love me some Chuck Bass. So I was like, yes. You know, <laughs> So I was like, I picked it up. And it's like, how did you come up with that world building to the characters? How you made Caroline in the first book versus how she was in the second book? Like, how did you come up with that whole plot? So I saw the plot from beginning to end, meaning beginning from filthy ending vicious. Like, so I saw the whole, like, I knew the whole thing in my head. And I sat with it for probably a year. Like, I daydreamed, wrote little things, like, while I was writing like the mafia books, I wrote it in between like little scenes and stuff, but I knew what it was. It like a movie in my head from the beginning of filthy all the way to the end of vicious little snake. So I knew what was going to happen. And those characters, I love gossip girl too. And I'm obsessed. And I just felt like there were a lot of like prep school romances that were being written and it, everything was like dark bully. And I just wanted to, I didn't like, I'd read a couple of them, like a bunch. Cause I felt for it just like everybody else. I was like, I love this. Like I'm devouring it. But I was like, what I really wish that I could read is like another kind of campy, like it's like gossip girl aesthetically, like just like kind of scandals and like real life kind of like bullshit that you like. You're like, how could you say that to me? And how could you tell him that? And I hate you. Like all of that kind of like feeling and like super contemporary where it's not bully and it's not secret society. And it's not like somebody comes in new to the school and you treat her like shit. And then all of a sudden you're like, but I'm in love with you. Like, I don't want, I didn't want that for this. I wanted it to be all these people on like a level playing field and how they kind of like just did life together in this fucked up way. And um, I wanted every character to kind of be morally gray. Like everybody was like, nobody was better than the other. Everybody was a little yeah. like dirty and grimy and everybody did some shitty things. Like no one was clean in the book. Like everybody did something kind of shitty to each other. And I wanted that to be like real life like that, where if you were in a friend group, sometimes it gets kind of muddy. And, um, and I knew that the, when I thought about it, like, I mean, I vibed off of gossip girl a lot because like, you know, my like Serena comes back into the world and that's what throws it upside down. And so I kind of had Serena and Blair as my, you know, uh, Donovan and my Caroline, except Caroline would eat Blair alive. Like that's the reality. But like, I had those characters kind of like in my head, they functioned in the same kind of capacity and that it like through the, it really revolved around the girls, which is why I changed the coverage to the girls because those worlds revolve around the girls, not the boys. And so um, I had that in my head, but I was very like conscientious about, it's not any kind of like gossip girl storyline or anything like that. Like it's my own fresh version of this book, but I wanted that same campiness and feel where like somebody would go to brunch in like a fucking Chanel outfit. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, or they were like, you know, where are the parents through any, like, where are the parents? <laughs> Nobody knows. Nobody knows. They're off like jet setting. Like, where are the parents? Like, and so I wanted that same kind of feel in a book and I was looking for it and I couldn't find it. So I thought, fuck it, I'll write it. So I did. Will you ever go back to that world? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> are you going to go back? very fast that I said that. I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I would go back to that world. I almost wrote Kai's book, but I'm not, that's not for me to write. And so um. I thought about that for a long time, writing Ty's book. And it just, I had a lot of like questions about like what was right and what was wrong. And so many questions made me stop and go, perhaps that's not for me to write. So maybe if I ever find a writer who writes male, male, because I feel like that would do him justice, like a male, male, because for me, he always feels like Caroline's and I could never give him a heroine. Um, but I'm not a, like, I am not a bisexual man. So I don't think I could ever do his book justice. And that's just being honest. Like, I'm sure that there are plenty of writers. I'm not saying women shouldn't write that. I just, I don't feel like I could do it justice. But if I ever met a writer or read somebody's book that did that beautifully, then I would 100% let them write Kai's book and like sit in on it and make sure that it was like written correctly. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. I couldn't do that. That's not to say women can't. I just cannot do that. Um, and uh 
I can never, cause I, part of it is if I feel unconfident about it, I can never go into a book then and like change my confidence level. Like I don't feel confident writing it. So I'm always going to feel unstable as I write it and it'll feel unstable to the reader. Um, but I thought about writing a uh, follow-up book where it's all of their POVs. Mm-hmm. So we can switch around and just kind of take them through the end of high school into college and kind of then do an epilogue where like they end. Well, that would be so nice. I think that would be kind of fun. Right. But we'll see what happens. I mean, I say that it's in my head. I've been sitting on it a lot and I kids, every time I say it, I want to do it more and more, but I have this rom-com to write first. So we'll see after that. Maybe I'll write that and see what I can do about that. Cause I really would love to kind of close their stories out. Yeah, just and like also give the readers an insight because I feel like I love when we see like the future lives of characters, yeah. like where they ended up, especially if they're in high school. You're like, okay, this was high school. What happened? In what college? happened? Right. What well, happened? And if, you, if you read the bonus story from Filthy Little Pretties, like they got married in Paris mm-hmm. and they're still yeah. in high school. Cause they're both 18, like seniors at 18. So they're married in Paris, but they're in high school. Like they got married during spring break. So like what, how did, what happened after that? Like, you know how what do mean? they navigate marriage? How, so young. How like, do they tell their friends? How do they find out he's supposed to go to the Olympics? What's happening right now? Like I kind of want to clear, I kind of want to close it all up and like bring it all together. So I'm sure it'll happen one of these days, maybe for the anniversary of it. Oh, crossing my fingers. Because I would love that. Um, <laughs> jumping into um, Just Like Heaven and Sinning Like Hell. I've said this and I feel like whenever whenever I read that book, we had just started the podcast. And I remember paying, I don't know if you remember, I was going crazy about it. Like I remember I could not stop talking because I had just finished uh, Just Like Heaven. And if you haven't read it, the ending to that book. It's beautiful. Like speechless i think i spam trulina's messages like i was like what <laughs> the freaking hell like when is the next book coming out like what's gonna happen are you done writing it send it yeah. to me i need it and it's like yeah. and i speak this with like all honesty and i will tell you like that duet was phenomenal it Thank is you. one of my favorite do du- favorite books i've ever read just because Thank it's you. like the way you grow with these characters and it feels like you're watching a movie because yeah th- this do it is like a modern romeo and juliet yes sexier it's yeah. more thrilling it's more suspenseful and yeah. i remember and i can still picture it in my head like if i'm reading the book and i'm watching it as a movie whenever yeah. they meet for <sighs> the whole that's time, my favorite scene in the first book whenever they meet she turns on a cigarette and that's when he comes in. And I remember the feeling of reading that part. And my heart was like, like, it was just so sexy. It was so like, thrilling, suspenseful. It was like, I don't think a book has ever made me feel so like, on edge of my seat while reading that scene. So yeah. how did you come up with that whole plot? Because it is a modern Romeo and Juliet, like, mm-hmm. Do you love Romeo and Juliet? Do you like, like I do, but I love like yeah. like I was watching the Leo and Claire Danes movie, you know, the movie, the Romeo yeah. and Juliet that like and I love that one because I mean young Leonardo DiCaprio, like and so I was watching it and I watched it all the time and I was watching it and then a lot of times things like this happened to me is that I was watching it and I was like, I wonder what happened if he like, you know, in your head you're like, I wish you would have lived. And I was like, and if he lived, and if he lived, and it was like dot dot dot. It was just kind of stuck in my head. And I was like, dot dot dot. And I was like, what if I wrote like he lived? And then I was just sitting there with it for a while. And then um, I was talking to one of my very best friends. I've had the same like five, six friends since I was 12. So we're like this little group of people we've known since like sixth grade. And um, I talked to them a lot about something like this. Like I'll just throw it out into the group. Like, hey, what if I did this? And we're very supportive. They're like incredibly successful women. I'm so proud of them. I love them so much. And um, they, uh, I'll get like, you know, responses back or whatever. And a lot of times it's like, remember when you blah, 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 or remember when you were dating, da, 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 like things like that will happen, you know? And um, that scene where she's hiding behind the bathroom and the boy, and he walks back and he takes the cigarette from her, like the way he takes it from her 
you know, he lets it slip through like his fingers like this and he pulls it from her and he like smokes it. Um, that happened to me. That was my real life. Really? Mm -hmm. And so I used it and that's why I think it feels so real because it was real. And it's the way you wrote that scene. And I'm telling you, I can picture it in my head. And I haven't read that book in a while, but I can mm -hmm. still remember word for word, detailed by detailed of that scene. It feels so. Well, and mine wasn't as sexy. Like he just was like, <laughs> we have that, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, Why are you <laughs> and I was like, you know, I didn't even get to puff on it. Like whatever. But like that was Catholic, but I was a Catholic school girl, like trying to do bad mm -hmm. shit, whatever. But um, <laughs> get getting bad with God. So like, But like, but it's, I think that the thing that makes that scene so the best is that he doesn't say anything. No, he just no. goes to her, looks at her, takes the cigar and he, like the cigarette. And you're just like, oh my God. Is that he was say cool. something? Right. And it's he's like, no. And then he, the it's way he blows not, out the smoke, like it's just, yeah. And that scene felt so like private that I'm like, it. while I was reading, I was like, I feel like I'm intruding. <laughs> Right. That's exactly how I wanted you to feel because their chemistry needed to pop off. I mean, let's be real. Romeo and Juliet is insta love, right? Yeah. Like in the real Romeo and Juliet, she's 13 and he's 17, which is already gross in itself. Like I'm not writing that, but like they, but they were, it was insta love. The minute he saw her, he was like, I love you. And she was like, we're getting married. Let's do it. Like they were right away. So I was like, I have to write insta love and people, you know, insta love can be like hit or miss with people. Yeah. But I think the, um, the secret to insta love is building like an instant. I believe like they were never insta love to me. They were insta attraction, like yeah. insta chemistry. So it was like, and, and you have to like, in my head, I was like, they are star crossed. So the chemistry is pulling them together, even though they, they don't get it. They don't understand it it's like two magnets just being drawn to each other. So mm -hmm. I have to keep putting them every time they're around each other, they have to be like, shoo, like where they, and in my head, when I thought them up immediately, I saw them standing next to each other and Calder always stood a little too close to her. Like every time I was putting them in the scene in my head, I would always picture him kind of like, you know, how someone comes and stands next to you and you're like boundaries, man. Like they just stand a little too close. Yeah, I mean, like, what the hell? This is my dance circle. That's your <laughs> dance circle, you know? So, like, that was how he was to me, that he just always stood a little too close to her because boundaries never existed between them. Yeah. And she never recoiled back. Like, it was never, she didn't even understand that he was breaking a boundary because it felt very natural for them to just be like this all the time. Do you know what I mean? And so I saw them like that in my head and I thought, oh, okay, that's what they are. They're like twin flames. They're star-crossed. Like, that's it. And so that's how I wrote them. Where, like, the minute he takes the cigarette, everything stops existing except them. Even though everything's around them and people are whispering to them, the only thing that exists is them from the very get. Yeah. And that's how they, you know, even when he was like, when they meet outside, you know, on accident, right? Like at the beach and the way that he's like in her face, the way that he's like so close to her, like talking to her, they're already like talking too close to each other. Do you know what I mean? Like, and, and he follows, like, they can't, she steps and he steps. Like, they were always um, simpatico from the minute they meet. And so that's how I just, I fashion their entire relationship like that. And like I said, I think that there's a difference between Insta Love and Star Crossed. It, there's a huge difference for me. And I think mm -hmm. most people picked up what I was throwing down. Some people called it Insta Love still, but I still think that it was never Insta Love for them. It was the fate. It was fated. It wasn't, it was more than Insta Love. I feel like what built it up was the tension because every mm -hmm. time they were on screen together, mm -hmm. you felt what they were yeah. feeling, which yeah. made it, for me, it, I didn't, I don't consider it instant love just because I think no. it's yeah. a lot of tension and like world building to get them to the point where they ended up in. Mm -hmm. uh, and like, I feel like their love was a foregone conclusion though. We all knew that they were going to be in love. Like that was it. But also in like, they fall in love in like four weeks or something like that. Like, but in, in high school age, who doesn't say I love you after four weeks? Are you kidding? You're breaking up after four months. Yeah. Oh, four months is a long relationship. It's like, you've been, you're ready to have babies. Like, what are you talking about? Like, you've been together forever and it's been like four months, you know, like you're everybody. Like, you're like, like, you the <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, so it felt very natural and their chemistry was so, oh my gosh, it just, it felt like it jumped off at me. Like I couldn't get past it. I was like saturated in it all day when I was writing them. It was great. They were easy to write. Which between Stanton and Calder, what character was harder for you to write? Because I felt like they both had very 
hard relationships in their life to mm -hmm. where, you know, they couldn't be together. So which one for you was harder to write? Mm, I have to be honest that not neither of them were difficult. Like they floated off my pen. Mm. The only thing that was hard for me was that I set, I set like a very hard um, release date in between. And mm. I'm a slow writer. I'm not a very fast writer. I like to really pay attention to the words that I'm using. And um, I can't like a lot of people can put it all out and then they go back and like judge it up, you know, like make it fix it and like make it nice. I have to be done with that paragraph before I can move to the next one. So it's a very inefficient way to write. So it takes me a long time. And um, sending like hell took me a little bit of time. Like I was writing down to the wire for that book. Not a lot of people know that. Actually, nobody knows that. But I was writing down to the wire for that book. Um, I had my editor and my proofer on standby. So every chapter I finished, I sent it to the editor. She sent it to the proofer. It came back to me. Like legitimately, like we were, I, I pushed publish on sending like hell like I put, I had an hour, I had 45 minutes left before Amazon would cancel the pre-orders. And really? I put the final, I put the final product in 45 minutes before I oh. went down to the wire. I was writing it the day of that. I had to put it in the Amazon thing that day. I was writing it before I hit publish on it. So like it took, because there was a lot of things like I got halfway through it and I was like, wait, I'm missing something. Wait, no, no, that's not right. I have to go back. And I changed a ton of stuff to make it to what it was. Like I just mm -hmm. had, I just had gone the wrong direction and I just knew it instinctively. I knew it and I had to like redo. So I had to redo a bunch of stuff. Um, but neither one of them were hard to write for me because they just were so fully realized in my head that it almost felt like I was just like, a, it felt like I was just the medium that they were using to get their story out. They've never, I've never had characters feel so real to mm -hmm. me all the other characters felt like characters, but still had their voices in my head. But like, they felt like characters Calder and Sutton felt like people. And they were just like, tell our story. And I was telling the story and I was being used to tell the story and it was exhausting and it was emotional. And I felt what they were feeling. And I cried in the sad parts and I sobbed at the end. Like, I mean, I sobbed like ugly cried at the very end because I also felt like a very long period of time. And this makes me sound like a psycho, but at the end of the book, it felt a lot like grief for me. And I had a really hard time letting them go. And it felt like I was losing friends. Like I had lost people that I loved because I had formed such a strong bond with those characters while writing it. It was hard for me to walk away from that book. It was hard for us <laughs> to finish that book. Let me tell you, like I felt like that. And I'm happy you said that because I feel like us as readers, we, well, at least for me, I, it felt weird reading it because I was actually like, it was a weird experience for me because it felt like I was watching a movie. I was not yes. reading, I was watching a movie and I was following, and I was seeing these two characters like, like with Sutton come to terms with her sexuality too. It's like, because it's, there's a lot of firsts in these, in this duet to yes. where like you're growing with them you're learning with them you're feeling the chemistry for the first time with them yes so that was and it was really important that i did the like first times right and that i did the like i wanted it to all be like feel real like i did not want to go from these very real i mean we've all we've all been in love at least once some of us have not but like most of us have been i mean i shouldn't say most of us like a good chunk of us have been in love for the first time and that feeling I remember having that kind of feeling like I fell in love for the first time in high school and then kind of was like, you know, had that moment where he had to like, be, we were like ripped apart. Like he had to move. Like it was that kind of thing. And it was very, very emotional. And I remember feeling those kind of like, I didn't eat for weeks and I didn't like, I was just so distraught. And like, there was like the whole, like holding onto each other's hands, not wanting to let each other go thinking about running away. Like there was that kind of passionate teenage the way that you never feel love again you never feel love like that again as an adult because you're like we're not running away you just have to move we'll do long distance like it all becomes very rational right but like when you're a teenager it's like that's it that's all that matters do you know what I mean and so i was really in that place with them in a big way and i swear like i my poor husband i feel so bad for him because he was like, are you okay? And I was like, no one will love me like that. No, <laughs> he was like, I'm standing right here, you idiot. And I was like, ah. I'm like, I'm falling apart. <laughs>
but it was, I mean, it's pretty special. I love that book and it's so important to me and I wish that more people would read it, but you know, I wish that it was also at number 11 on the charts, but maybe one day it will be. I love that duet. And I felt it was so, and it was sad too, because I'm not going to say that, but there's a certain death in the book that I hated you for it. Cause I was like, everyone oh, did dare you do that. <laughs> like I did, I, there's stuff that happens in the book that I never saw coming. And yes. There's stuff that breaks my heart. And then you're like, well, you know what? This completed the story. This needed to happen because of this. And, but it's, I, I was so mad. But you hate that it has to happen. I, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, listen, uh, you're not the only one. I got so much hate email. <laughs> <laughs> and I responded back to all of it. I was like, don't worry. It'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody was so angry. I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But it, you know, it had to happen. It was necessary. But it's sad. I mean, I've never, you know, killing a character is a big deal. Yeah. At least it's not a dog. I think people would have been even more. <laughs> I would have been like, Trulina, you how a dog. dare you? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> That's funny. So for uh, this duet, I felt like it was more forbidden romance for Tangled and So Tinsel was, uh, I would say, the white shoes trope. Yeah. It's like holiday escapism. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, yeah. What holiday kinky. How do you, that you haven't yet, do you want to write that you haven't? That is so hard for me to answer because I don't think in terms of tropes, right? Because you could put, like, the Hillcrest series, you could say enemies to lovers sometimes, friends to lovers, second chance. Like, it's such a, like, a, like a, I put them all in a bucket. Like I just mix them all up and throw them out there, you know? Um, hmm. I don't know. We'll see, I guess. I mean, I can tell you that the next one is, what trope would it be? Huh? Inter I'm like, I'm trying to think now, maybe revenge, second chance. Friends to lovers. And this is the rom com? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> revenge? <laughs> revenge. Yeah, it's like a revenge plot. Second chance. Friends to lovers. Uh, what other tropes are there? Yeah, I think so. Like, that might be. There's a couple other tropes that could probably apply. You know what? I mean, listen, it's, it says it in my bio, rebellious romance with heart. Like I'm going to give you a little bit of funny and heart, you know what I mean? But I'm going to also always be really rebellious. I don't want to just have to write kind of that, you know, if somebody's like, write me an office romance, I'm not going to give you a boss an employee and this happens. And I don't want it to ever be predictable. I want, I don't want you to see it coming ever, ever. Mm -hmm. You know, so I just, it would like make me crazy, you know, like to have to do it that way. So, and that's not, that's just me. That's not to say that that's bad. I love those when I know exactly what's happening, but like, I need it to be unexpected when I'm writing it. Well, I'm excited. Now I'm very, I'm very curious. Like, the next book is, I can tell you the title because I've already told it. I wasn't supposed to. And then I accidentally blurted it out and now everybody knows. <laughs> it's called Love on Repeat. Oh, I love that title. Thank you. I do too. <laughs> do you have like a release uh, for that? March. March. <laughs> and it's definitely a romantic comedy and I am calling it high spice. Like everybody's, you know, uh, everybody's levels are different for spice. Like five star, five chili peppers, four, like you never know, right? But I feel like we can all agree that Tangled and Tinsel is high spice. Yes. Depending, maybe it's a four for you. Maybe it's a five for you but like it's high spice. Um, the next one will also be high spice and a, and a rom-com, but it is just one girl, one guy. Well, and there's a threesome in them, but well, but there's, it's one, but it's one girl, one guy at the end. Mm. <laughs> oh, is, are you sure? It should, it should come out in January. I'm just saying. <laughs> I wish it could. Cause I feel like you're going to go by I should have been smarter and put the pre-order at the back of the book, but I'm not that smart. So <laughs> Um, but it'll be fine. Like it'll come out. I need time to like 
develop it more. I started writing it after I finished Tangled in Tinsel. So it has a little bit of, it has, it's been, it's being developed now, but like, <laughs> I still have to, I want to sit with it a little bit more. Cause I just feel like the pressure after this release, so many people have read this book that I feel like the pressure is I need to come out. Like they're going to be very disappointed if it's not as funny and, or it's not as spicy. So I need to make sure that I'm like developing it. So it's like very, you want to beta read it? It's like <laughs> super spicy <laughs> and it's, um, and it's, you know, funny. That's the most important thing. I'm excited. I feel like we don't have that. I feel like trad has like, when you look at traditional publishers and you look at indie publishing, like indie has like the market on like new adult and dark romance, like those two genres of romance, indie like dominates. So like, you notice that not a lot of trad authors put that stuff out because indie dominates it. Right. But in trad, they have like rom-com traditional authors dominate rom-com. And so when I was writing this, I was like, you know what? There's a niche in the market. Like there's a market for like, smuttier rom-coms like even though like tessa bailey's books are super smutty but they're never their trad authors are never going to be as smutty as we are do you know what i mean like we're a little bit more vivid in our conversations right so i feel like i wanted to be able to be like all right let's let me jump into this market because i'm pretty funny and i feel like we could and i'm also pretty smutty so i'm just gonna throw it out there and maybe we can like take over that market too <laughs> well i'm super excited because you're hilarious so i i'm i'm Pretty excited for your rom-com. Like, I'm actually pretty, really, really excited. I feel I, like I've started to win people over because people are like, wait, are you going to do more mafia or something? And I'm like, no. And they're like, oh. And then they read this and they were like, oh, more, 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 more. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> well, but I have, a, I have a couple of these planned because it's the holiday series. Mm -hmm. So there are a few more that will come out. Would you do more of the white shoes or are you going to stick with just... Not right now. I mean, maybe later, but right now it'll be, um, I'm going to, I'd like to change it up. Cause I feel like if I wrote a white shoes, it would be the same four guys again. They're still stuck in my head. You know what I mean? Like it would be, I would just be writing like another version of them and I don't want that. Like this is kind of their story. So mm -hmm. I want to change it up and do something new for the next people. I will, however, do the every woman story. I will not be, um, describing my heroine again. I like that. Yeah. I, I like I, it too, actually. And I did it for a, I did it for a, a I, I did it the reason I did it, I'm really happy that it's playing because I was nervous that it wouldn't, that people wouldn't like it. And it was really important. I was really hoping that people would. So I'm really happy that I decided to go that way. Well, I'm excited for everything that you're going to come. I'm excited for your rom-com. Um, before we let you go, we're going to play a little game with you. Oh, it's Lord. Okay. How well do you remember your books? And mostly like, we're going to read a quote from a book and you have to say which book it's from. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm going to get them all wrong. This is terrible. Okay. <laughs> uh, I don't remember anything I wrote. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. The first one. I'm like trying to concentrate. I'm like, okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> she, does, she doesn't have to be dead for you to know what it's like to be without her. <sighs> I mean, is the, she doesn't have to be dead for you to know. She doesn't have to be dead for you to know what it's like to be without her. That's about someone's mother. I feel like that's a conversation. That's about someone's mother. Hold on, give me a second, give me a second. <laughs> It's like to be without her. That's about somebody's mom being dead and somebody feeling like their mom's not with, and then they're, she, they're making that comparison and saying like, she doesn't have to be, um, that's Calder and Sutton. That's Calder to Sutton. Which book though? Um, <laughs> that's, that's, that's book number one in her bedroom for the bathroom scene. See? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yay! Okay, I had to put that together though. That was hard. <laughs> I feel like he's killed mothers off a lot in my book, so now I feel bad. I'm gonna call my mom and be like, I'm "Sorry, I don't mean to do that. I love you so much. You're great." Like I don't know. <laughs> the second one, not quite the sweet boy I remember you being. Much more, pre much more predator now than prey. Oh, that's Donovan the Gray, and when they first meet on the steps, mm -hmm. and he tells her, "Cherry's my favorite, my new favorite." flavor the third one we're all here with nothing to do but each other 
<laughs> let's take. Let's ta- mm. <laughs> <sighs> that's tangled in tinsel. Yes. Yep. I was nervous <laughs> that was the fun lake scene in Hillcrest. Okay. <laughs> I swear to God, if anyone ever fucking touches you, I'll kill them. Do you understand that? Oh man, come on. I wrote three mafia books. Um <laughs> that's gotta be Calder. Did you do my mafia books too? Or is it just <laughs> I'm looking? Can I call? Can I phone a friend? Um, <laughs> it is Calder. Okay, good. Phew. Okay. <laughs> Getting nervous. We can't walk away because love brings us back. But all the goddamn hate we feel for ourselves, each other creates our tragedy. Liam and Caroline. Yep. Like and okay. the last one. Uh oh. I wait there until his lifeless eyes stare up at the sky. Then I reach out and close them. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I reach out until his lifeless eyes stare up at the sky. I wrote that. Yes. Um, <laughs> and then I reach out and close them. Somebody dies, but. <laughs> Who the fuck died? Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Is that Calder to Hunter? Yes! <laughs> See, you got him all right. Yes. I, was, I had to wait there for a second. I was like, who the fuck did I kill? Did somebody <laughs> saw them die? Like, what in the world? I had to go back. That took a minute. Oh my gosh. That was so hard. Okay. But so thank happy. you so much, <laughs> Lena, for joining us today. And I want to take a second to congratulate you because you're slaying Amazon thank cards. You so your thank bugs. you so much. And I want everybody to pick it up because it's truly like, I don't read our age, but let me tell you, I enjoyed it. I was like, it was very, it's perfect for the holidays. It's a perfect book for the holidays. And it's you, like you write the best books ever. So Congratulations, and I am super, I cannot wait until March. I'm so excited. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate this. It was really fun. I liked it. You're welcome. I hope you have an amazing night. And again, congratulations, and I love you, and I cannot yeah. wait for March. <laughs> I love you back. Bye, Kang. Bye. You're so quiet, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so freaking much, Trilina. I seriously had the I love her so freaking much. And I'm very like I love her books. Like I've mentioned throughout this whole podcast. Like I don't read our age, but if give Tangled and Tinsel a chance, like it feels I think it's perfect for the holiday. It's just something so different about it. It doesn't feel I don't like it doesn't feel too much of a pressured book to read like I don't know if that makes sense it's just because each character you fall in love with each character like this these four heroes are so yummy I just love them but pick up the book it is slaying on the top charts right now Trilina is a boss babe love her and I'm so excited for everything that she's has coming in the next year so pick up Tangled and Tinseled pick up um her previous books, I really liked the, her Hillcrest series. That one's really good. Again, if you like Gossip Girl, I think you would love that book. It's a more modern, like, romance Gossip Girl. Because I feel like Gossip Girl was very, like, just about rich people, mm-hmm. life problems. And her series is more of, like, it, the romance is in it with problems, but it's more romance focused. So pick up her books. If you have any questions for us, just let us know. We are going to be back next week to talking about books that we've been reading. I've we've read a lot since the last time we did a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so mm-hmm. we'll be back to talking about that. Um, and don't miss because next week on Monday, we are revealing the cover and the author of our next box. Yep. So I'm excited for that. So keep an eye on that. Um, And then, like I said, we'll be back next week with more book talk or 
talk about all the books that we've been reading and book recommendations. And again, if you have any questions for us, just let us know. We hope everybody has an amazing week. Bye. Bye.